Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host Jason Turner. I am available for code reviews and on-site training. This episode, we're going to take a look at this. We're going to figure out why is my pair 310 times faster than standard pair. Fundamentally, pair at its core is just a struct with two public members, first and second. So why is mine this much faster? All right, so the first thing that you're almost certainly going to notice, and I know that the last time I did one of these versus kind of comparisons, I didn't get great feedback because there was a few things that I left out. And of course, always, anytime I compare two things, I'm going to get viewers that are like, oh, but you didn't compare these 13 other things. And we're going to see if we can actually try to cover all of the things in this episode, but I'll almost certainly miss something again. So feel free to comment about the thing that I missed. Now, obviously, I have disabled the do not optimize here. Now, let's look. We've got Clang 11, C++ 20 standard mode, optimization level 3, and I'm using LLVM's standard library. Now, if I just go ahead and change this to the GNU standard library, and still keep it at Clang, and still leave off these do not optimize, Let's go ahead and switch this over to GCC 10.2, just so we know what we're comparing. Okay, so first of all, we can see that it is a difference between Clang and GCC in this case. GCC has optimized both of these away to nothing, where Clang was not able to optimize away the standard pair, regardless of which standard library it used. Let's go ahead now and turn on these do not benchmark things here and do another comparison with both GCC and Clang. Okay, so for review, we're on GCC 10.2, optimization level 3, and I do use this do not optimize for both of these objects, and this is telling the compiler you're not allowed to completely remove these objects, basically, and it's used in the case of micro benchmarks. And then we just have a couple more things to try here with the do not optimize enabled. And let's go back to LLVM standard library and run another benchmark. Okay, so with libc++ LVM standard library on Clang 11 optimization level three and this do not optimize enabled here, we've got my pair is 5.4 times faster than standard pair. So we know that this comes down to an optimization that GCC is able to perform, but Clang is not. And now let's go ahead and change standard libraries one more time to use lib std C++ and see if we can narrow it down to the exact scenario that we're seeing uh, this uh, quite large performance difference. Okay, so the standard library doesn't matter. It's about four and a half times faster to use my pair than it is to use the standard library's pair with Clang. So we need to look specifically at Clang, but we also need to understand what is different between my pair and standard pair. Now, what we can see here is when I am doing this braced initialization of my pair, I am actually directly initializing the first and second elements. So I am directly calling their constructors that take a const character string. Now, even though at its core, pair is a very simple type with just a first and a second public element, its constructors are a completely different world. Okay, so as we can see here on CBP reference, it has types first and second, and they're public, and we can access them. But if we go and click on constructor, we can actually see that the situation is not so far away from the constructors for string, like in my previous episode on the 13 confusing whatever constructors overloads for string. So we've got the default constructor, that is constexpr now, 
And then we've got constructor that takes elements of type T1 and type T2. Now when we're calling the constructor for standard pair, we're not calling those constructors because we're not passing in standard string. We're passing in an object of type const character string. So that brings us to probably this constructor being called. This is the templated const expert pair constructor that takes a forwarding reference of type U1 and type U2. So it's a templated forwarding constructor that is then going to forward initialize the elements first and second. Uh, this is a templated copy constructor which really should be explicit. It says that C14 conditionally explicit, uh, anyhow. Um, and then defaulted copy constructor and defaulted move constructor and no destructor defined. We're going to let the compiler declare the destructor probably. Yeah, there's no destructor defined as far as I can tell. All right, so what we now need to look into is this constructor here. So let's go back to our benchmark. And let's see what happens. Uh, there's two different ways to look at this. The first one is we now know here we're not calling the constructor that we might have thought we were calling. We're calling this templated forwarding constructor. So let's just go ahead for fun and make sure that we are actually passing strings in. See if that changes anything. Um, it changed things a little bit, but mine is still 2.8 times faster. Now, I want to take a moment to just say that this episode is not necessarily about best practices. It's about, again, understanding your compiler and your standard library better to really understand what is going on and think about writing code that's more efficient for the situation that you're in. Now, do I recommend creating a bunch of types that have a bunch of public members and no constructors? Well, honestly, sometimes yes, but not all the time. So let's just keep that in mind here. Okay, so uh, that made something of a difference. So let's go ahead and then go ahead and add a constructor here. Actually, let's take a second and look back at the template, uh, the constructors that are provided by StudPair. So we've got one that takes a const reference to types T, uh, T1 and T2. That's const expert. And then we've got the templated one. So it would seem and we're gonna have to check this out, that this version where I am explicitly passing in strings is still creating a copy of each string, not moving it into place or forwarding it because the templated constructor is not gonna come into play here. It's an interesting decision. So let's try to recreate that. Okay, so I've just added my own constructor and I'm going to rerun this benchmark and we should be in the same situation now. Okay, now interestingly, my pair is somehow slower, um, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either. It should be creating an object of the same type. Let's just go ahead and make this explicitly strings down here as well. Okay, and we're seeing the same performance difference. Mine is about 1.2 times slower. Uh, let's go ahead and add in that templated constructor, but I really don't think that they would be calling the templated one. We're going to have to dig in to what exactly this is doing as we get a little bit further in, maybe it's Plus Insights, maybe looking at Compiler Explorer in a little bit later. So we've created forwarding references here, which need to actually be forwarded in to the members. And we're going to see if that makes a difference. I, again, I don't expect this constructor to actually be invoked. So we're going to have to see exactly which constructor is actually being called. And I think CPP insights will be good. C++ insights will be good for that.
Ah, all right, there we go. So it does seem that it is actually the forwarding constructor that is being called. We'll need to verify that again. So let's let's go ahead and actually verify that right now for the fun of it. Okay, so let's see, C++ Insights. does not seem to be able to tell us which constructor we're actually calling. So we will dig into Compiler Explorer. And let's make sure we turn on optimizations. I got in trouble with you all last time for that. That was a big oversight on my part. All right, uh, so these things did not get inlined even at 03. And let's make sure that we're looking at Clang because that's where we were looking earlier. All right, interesting. So when we pass in a standard string for both of these elements, we can see that the code all just goes away. But if we pass in our um, const character literal, then we see that it actually is making a call to one of the constructors. It is uh, the templated constructor that's taking the const character literals here. Put that back to this and see if we can just peer into this for just for a moment. I took it back down to 0. Right, okay. And it is calling the version, the templated constructor, as we can see here, that's taking our value references of the basic string match. Okay, so it's pretty much what we figured out. Okay, so let's see if we can do any better, perhaps. Now, what we need to see is why Clang, or what Clang is not optimizing away, I guess. So this is, again, C++20 mode, optimization level three, Clang 11. All right, so let's try to take this back to the version that showed the biggest performance difference. And then let's also take a look at debug performance versus runtime performance. All right, I believe that's the right version. And we had cached results for it, 4.6 times slower, and this is with 03. Okay, 03, and we're going to get rid of these explicit calls to string. And again, we can see here that it is actually having to explicitly call the templated constructor and do that thing. And it's a constructor call that's somehow not being inlined, which I find a little confusing since it is a templated constructor and I don't see it even being generated in the binary here. Let's go ahead and recreate my pair as well. Now this becomes a very interesting function because we're creating these things that's fit into small string optimization and we're not actually getting any of it optimized away. Let's use my pair instead. And we know that my pair is going to directly initialize the contained members. So my pair becomes just a ret. And this is something Clang is able to see all the way through. And if we take this to GCC, we can see that GCC, in fact, is able to see all the way through this as well into the small string optimization and see, oh, this is not something that we are actually using and it's able to just optimize the whole code away. We know that the templated constructor version was not as efficient as it could be. So I'm curious what happens if I just create an R value reference constructor, if this is enough to confuse Clang or not here. And it's not. So if I have an R value reference constructor, then Clang sees all the way through this as well, and it still optimizes my pair to just a ret. So interesting, uh, because the parameter first and second is actually going to become a standard string in those cases, because it's the only constructor available to it. It's going to coerce them into a standard string called the implicit conversion operation through the single parameter constructor that's provided by standard string. And 
then it can do something kind of like perfect forwarding. So let's go ahead and get back to this version where I'm using forwarding references instead of R value references. Then I need to use standard forward correctly. And we can see that this is where it falls down. Once we push it through this forwarding constructor is when it's it, it can no longer optimize the code away. And in fact, it makes my version somehow look way worse. And it should be the same thing from what we saw previously. We have objects F and S of forwarding reference types. We're doing a perfect, we're doing a forward into the members first and second, and I'm passing in character string. Oh, okay. Yeah, the difference here is that we can see that it's calling my constructor down here. Now, my constructor didn't get inlined but it is available um, inside the code. That's why it looks so much larger. If we look at the standard library use pair, then the code that is generated is exactly the same. We just don't have our std pair constructor available to us in this output on Compiler Explorer. This episode's going way longer than I expected it to, but it's a lot of interesting things to dig in here and kind of wonder like, okay, what are the limits for what the compiler can optimize or not? And then we should expect to see, based on all of our experimentation, that if I explicitly pass in strings here, then the strings will get optimized away because it doesn't have this extra level of indirection with the constructor. And yes, in fact, we do see that happen. So it makes me wonder if we were to somehow convince the compiler to actually inline our forwarding constructor, would it be able to then optimize all of this away? And let's see if we can do that. Now, just giving inline here, I've done previous episodes on this. This is generally not a good idea. And see, the compiler just takes it as a suggestion. It didn't, it didn't inline. The code here clearly it definitely out of line it. Uh, let's see about a force in line pragma. Now this is definitely not something I know off the top of my head because this is generally a bad idea and I had to go look it up. But it looks like if we give it an attribute always in line, then there we go. After the compiler inlined it, it actually was able to make the code smaller. So this appears to be a problem partially with Clang's decision-making for what should be inlined. By actually inlining it, which would generally make the code larger, it actually was able to make the code smaller because then the compiler was able to see more follow-up optimizations to perform. And that is in fact very interesting. Now, Again, this is not a best practices episode. I do not at all suggest that you go around putting attribute always in line on your code. But I might suggest that you actually reconsider whether or not your simple type needs a constructor at all. Because if you don't have a constructor here, you are always, always going to get the most efficient possible construction of your type. Now there's all kinds of other questions to answer, but we're talking about something like pair where the members were already public. So I don't think we really lose anything by not having a constructor. So something to consider. Thank you for watching this episode of C++ Weekly. I hope I covered all of your questions. If I didn't cover all of your questions, a large point of why I do these episodes is to teach you how to investigate things on your own. So if you see something that I overlooked, please figure it out, comment on it, make a note here on YouTube, see what I missed. I don't think I overlooked anything this time. Thank you for watching this episode of C++ Weekly, and be sure to subscribe.